Half of the world now lives in cities, and the future of humanity depends largely on how we understand this tidal wave of urbanization. Cities are potentially epicenters of undreamt wealth and diversity, but for most of their inhabitants, the reality remains harsh and exclusionary. The right to the city grants everyone access to what their city has to offer and to be part of making their city. Every citizen is entitled to a standard of living that fosters freedom, equity and dignity. On paper, it's a powerful concept, but the reality tells a different story. To stay really in a place whereby there is no electricity, there is no water, there are even no toilets, it's frustrating. It is ironic that approaches to urban development, supposedly intended to improve the lives of all urban residents, often result in or reinforce exclusion and disempowerment. When the apartheid uh, ended, I was thinking of better life than before. I was thinking of better education. I was thinking of the money. I was thinking of the house. I was thinking of so many beautiful things, you know. It's been hard for me, you know, because I'm a family man who should support the family. I'm a domestic worker. I work whole week. I'm doing babysitting and I love doing my work. In this area here where I live, yeah, most of us is coloreds here. I've seen a few whiteys here at the back of this place, but it's very, it's like about, say, not even five people that I saw whiteys and we got like foreigner people here. We never actually um, communicate with black people as a child, I can't remember that I ever had a friend that's an African or a whitey. Multicultural coexistence has become synonymous with South Africa. Yet, many would argue that this is no more than a concept, a myth we like to believe. The white areas is nicer. Because the white people got more better houses, and it's because the white people had more opportunities than us, and even jobs, they had better, better jobs, they earn more money. And most of the whites do have education. My struggle that I have is my son that's on tuck. Yeah, yeah, in fact, there isn't actually like things that you can do. That's why the kids they are going to, to gangster and using drugs and stuff like that. I get money easily. I mean, if I get in a taxi, jump out of that taxi in another taxi, get tender in, out of that taxi in another taxi. But at the end of the day, I'm just using the, the money for taxi. I think the reason also why the children is on Takia is because most of the parents don't even have a house. The majority of them live in shacks. And I mean, if, if they grow up, youngsters like to be, to live in a house where they can have their own rooms where they know their friends can come in the house. So I think that's the reason why they get easily in the stuck thing. I'm packing my bag, I'm going to town. As I'm presently unemployed, I'm going to look for work. So I pack my overall for just in case. Central to making the city accessible for all is safe and affordable transportation. Poor public transportation will continue to exclude the majority from urban opportunities simply because they cannot reach them. Taxis are so expensive. Because in a taxi I must pay 3 rand from here to Site C. From Site C I must pay 11 rand. The question is, where, where do you get the money if you are not working? 
In South Africa, RDP houses are being built on the periphery of the city, whilst middle-class suburbs continue to be developed in close proximity to economic opportunity, reinforcing the Great Divide. I want to achieve a lot in life, but it's not easy. I see some advertisement in, in the paper. Maybe I do have a money to call. They will say to me, no, how about you come visit our offices? Then those will be like hard for me. For all its economic wealth and potential, the city should be able to support urban livelihoods and the prospect of meaningful work. But does it? It takes more than 30 to 40 minutes to get into town and uh, 16 when return. And here there's no one who's working. I know that things don't usually come in the silver part. I have to go there to get them, but I'm trying, I'm trying. I enjoy making working sticks because it's like a talent because I've been doing this and then I've never seen the other people doing some kind of uh, working stick that I'm doing. After finishing uh, making them, the question is where should I go and sell them? I was uh, in a long street, if I'm not mistaken. And there were three white guys who phoned me because they were interested in buying working sticks. When I came there, they trying to take out the money to give it to me so that I can give them the working sticks. And then the security guard, guard came in and then asked me, are you selling these things in town? I said, yes. He said, you don't have uh, permission. Then they, they take me, they want to arrest me, and then they said uh, they need uh, my ID. So I left to phone home for my wife to give, to come with uh, the ID so as to see whether I'm a South African or not. Then I tried to explain to them that I'm a South African to show that I can even speak seven official languages of this country. I was like, I'm a foreigner in my beloved country. We are told that our city belongs to every one of us, but urban planning sends out a very different message as the vast majority remain excluded from what the city has to offer. I'm still having that concept of a uh, rich man will always be rich and then a poor man will always be poor at this age. <laughs> I thought that maybe I'll be having a house, maybe a uh, good education with nice family, living nice life, but it's vice versa. Clearly, there is a pressing need to bring about change, to revision, reimagine, and repurpose available space in a manner that is inclusive, equitable, and sustainable. But urban land is a precious commodity. Its use and value are closely guarded by a small minority. What if a piece of vacant land in a well-located and affluent suburb was cleverly utilized to build homes and social amenities for those who needed them? I've seen other commons being destroyed by development and all that, and it destroys the very purpose, I believe, for which the common was created. It would be very sad. I accept there is a need for housing, for working class people closer to the city. But I certainly don't believe that Rondebosch Common is the right place for it. I take our dogs walking. Um, the kids like to catch tadpoles there. And it's just nice to have a bit of greenery. People living here are of Caucasian background. And when they talk about low-cost housing, I mean, ultimately, it's going to involve the so-called people of colour, isn't it? Mm. Am I right? Mm. So at the end of the no. day, what's going to happen basically is these people are going to complain. They're going to feel they're being swamped by people of, of the different culture. I mean, look, you must call a spade a spade and not an agricultural implement. I mean, that's what it is in life, <laughs> isn't it? People in Rondebosch, most of them have got cars. But it's a great place, it's close to public transport, taxis, trains, you know. You can get into you know, town to work and things like that, you know. It's a difficult one where you actually do get ground and there's a big sort of a push against allowing that type of development into the suburbs type of thing. But we do need to get ground for that, but not, not the open ground. We've been exposed to this low-cost housing gimmick for years and years. No. And at the end of the day, it develops into glorified squatter camps. That's what it is. If the current thinking on urban development doesn't change, we will see no change in what has been called the social engineering of exclusion. When a new kind of thinking leads to a new kind of action, it becomes possible for citizens to participate in their own city-making. 
New forms of development must empower marginalized communities to play a role in their own upliftment. With state acting as facilitator rather than deliverer, people are given the opportunity to help develop their own city and with it a spirit of ownership and empowerment. When residents of Joe Slovo informal settlement were instructed that they would be relocated to Delft to make way for a housing project, they formed a task group and working committee to effectively engage government over the process so as to remain in their homes. To be here in Joslovo, it's advantageous. You just walk across the road, you search for a job. You go over here, you'll see the, the so-called Imarike, they call it Imarike. When you go there, you get fruit, you get potatoes, you come and eat. It is better here in Langa because I've got some sense to buy some small things for my children. So if you are, you are moving, we are moving in Delft, there's no transport, there's, we are suffering from hunger, and even schools, because our children are, are studying here in Langa. So we decided to combine as a community, then to form a sort of a community, we call it TASIM. The people, they think that if you talk about the people of Choslovo or the TASIM of Choslovo, they think that the, the Choslovo community are working against the government, and we're not. We're working with the government. But we can't say yes, 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 yes. They must accept no, no, no. They can't say if they say no, we have to arrest them because they say no. It doesn't work like that in a democratic society. The Tokyo Sukhwala was here in Joslovo. I was with them and told them that we cannot go to Delft. And we did show him how far is Delft, how far is Cape Town. And we show him the factories are surrounding Langa. And I found one thing from him that he, he don't know Delft. He don't know Epping, whatever we are talking about, they don't know about it. So now on that day, he did see all those places. So uh, I think we are looking forward to, to talk with him again. If we want something to be strong, we must work together. So the government must hear us as a community, you know. Such communities are living proof that collectivity is key and that bold and innovative action can lead to social change. The right to the city is about finding democratic ways to live together by investing in our collective capacity and well-being as opposed to individualism. A new approach to urban development is not only possible, but necessary. Development is not just about delivery. It is fundamentally about constructing pathways that will lead to a better future for all urban residents. <laughs> Koto <laughs> It is only when social justice, equity and sustainability are at the core of our image of the city that the right to the city can become a lived reality for all of us. Faces, urban faces, abrasive, landscape, the mind maps, winding railway tracks, subdivided, four white neighborhoods, colored buffers, cape flats, Indians and blacks, separated individuals with skin colors to match, jumping on the iron wagon, heading to the concrete dragon, I wonder how it all began, that we were segregated was the plan, with public transportation, RDP housing schemes lack innovation, roads were mapped opposing integration, still composed of a first class minority and third world nation, the working class building layers of...